Good evening and welcome everybody to the City of Lake Forest Park City Council regular business business meeting for Thursday, September 26th. And with that, where are we here? I will lead us in the Pledge of the of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic, which is stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and with that, do I hear a motion for adoption of the agenda? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Yes, Councilmember. Um. I was wondering if maybe we want to move proclamations uh, before public comments so that our folks can uh, head out of here and uh, continue the celebrating. Any What's your pleasure, Council? Uh, yes. 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 Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the the motion is is to uh, to move uh, procl proclamation in advance of public comments. All those in favor of the. Agenda as amended, please say aye. 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 Any nays? The ayes have it. Thank you, Council. So, with that, we're going to move on to proclamation for. There we go. For this is a proclamation for honoring Calvin Hillman. You back there? You are back there. We're going to speak into the microphone. So, um, honoring and thanking Calvin Hillman. Whereas, um, oh, I'm sorry, City of Lake Forest Park building official. Whereas on October 1st, 2024, after more than 20 years of exemplary service to the City of Lake Forest Park, building official Calvin Kilman will retire. And whereas Calvin has devoted countless hours to inspecting homes, buildings, and projects throughout the city, always willing to lend his expertise and assist others where needed. And whereas Calvin has had the privilege of working under three mayors and alongside numerous city council members, consistently demonstrating his dedication to the betterment of the community. And whereas Calvin's leadership and unwavering commitment to the success of the city's building operations have been invaluable, making him a vital part of our organization's achievements. Whereas during his tenure, Calvin earned a reputation for being knowledgeable, competent, professional, conscientious, and dependable, dependable while also bringing wit, definitely wit, and deep compassion to his interaction with staff and residents alike. And now, therefore, the mayor and the city city council of the city of Lake Forest Park do hereby extend their deepest gratitude and congratulations to Calvin Kil Kilman, city of Lake Forest Park building official, on his retirement from public service and wish him the best, all the best, for a joyful, fulfilling, and well-deserved retirement signed this 26th day of September 2024. Calvin, thank, thank you so much. much. Beach, 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 beach. We're gonna get a white. We're gonna get a whiteboard out for you. <laughs> and while you're doing that, the chief is gonna duct tape the mannequin head to your. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, the best, everybody who achieved the Dean Lindsay. And then we go on again. But, anyways, my personal counselor, Jeff, has <laughs> counseled me for three years. Look at this the hell out. We work so closely together right after COVID. And all the street stuff that we have coming in, permitting comes through me, and then it's got to get approved by him, and that's got to come back to me. And I'm kind of like, is Swiss Army knife? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So, anyways, great counsel, Chief. What more can I say about Phil? I've already said the best. Yeah, my brother Kim over the years. Everybody, I'm gonna miss you so much. And uh, thank you. I've had 36 years in this trade working in the codes. And uh, I tell you, this has been the best. People here are great. You know, they they want to know. Yeah, I go, I, I'm sure Chief knows this. I can go in the house of someone that doesn't I've never seen before, and you go. Your talent, right? Go, yeah. Go, oh God, you return on that. They talk about the chief and you know the mayor and they want to talk and you know half the time I'm running out the door ready have another inspection to do, but it has been a pleasure. I am so humbled to work here and I love this place. I will always thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's get all that. I know you don't like the phone call. Yeah, I see. Come on. Jeff, why don't you come out here? I'm going to have a picture. I'm going to have a picture. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. So am I supposed to like look at that? A smile. That's all I need. All right, wait, let me see if I get it. Hold on, let me get a little uh, The mayor's got cold hands. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't have a problem. Let me know when you're ready. Okay, I'm ready. Okay. 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 Staff picture. Can you get a couple of guys up here? Yeah. Yeah, Mark, oh, please. Yes. I can take it. <laughs> yeah, get the directors up here. Lindsay, why don't you get up there too? I'll sit way back. Try not to block. All right. Why don't you guys come over here? Yeah. 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 Thanks. Great, thanks. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. And, uh, Calvin will be sorely missed, but we know he'll come back and visit us. Check in once in a while. Okay, moving on, we are going to uh, open a public comment. And um, here's our standard blurb. The council will not be accepting online public comments. This portion of the agenda is set aside for the public to address the council on agenda items or any other topic a council may have purview or control over. However, the mayor or council may not respond to comments from the public. If the comments are about nature that the council does not have influence or control over, then the mayor may request that the speakers suspend their comments. The council may direct staff to follow up on items brought up by the public. Comments are limited to a three minute time limit. Chief. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, we have several folks here that would like to make comment. Let's see. Camera uh, Erickson, welcome. Hello. Please. And I don't know whether the microphone is on, but my pre All press. Right, let's see. Oh, it's on. Okay. Yes. All right. Good evening, Mayor French and council members. My name is Tamara Erickson, and I'm a resident of Lake Forest Park. I'm here tonight to strongly encourage you to reconsider the mayor's budget and include funding for a climate manager for our city. At the June 13th, 2024 city council meeting, you formally accepted the Lake Forest Park Climate Action Plan researched and developed by the city appointed Climate Action Committee over the past two years. This plan is now the policy to guide our city in reducing greenhouse gas emissions and building resilience to the growing impacts of climate change. The plan stresses the urgency of taking direct creative action to protect our residents and ecosystems from the devastating and costly consequences of inaction. We're already seeing the impacts of climate change in our community from increased flooding and wildfire smoke 
to extreme heat days that threaten the health of our most vulnerable residents, including children and seniors. A climate manager would play a critical role in preparing us for these challenges by helping us secure state and federal grants, coordinating efforts with neighboring cities, and conducting outreach to ensure our community is informed and engaged. One of the major focuses of the Climate Action Plan is addressing transportation, which accounts for 69% of Lake Forest Park's greenhouse gas emissions. The plan envisions a near future where low to no carbon options are widely used, from electric vehicles to safer, more accessible public transit. To achieve this, we need a dedicated climate manager to lead these initiatives, ensuring that we transition from fossil fuels to cleaner, more sustainable options. Additionally, the climate manager would help implement the plan's recommendations, such as increasing the city's capacity to adapt to climate impacts, improving energy efficiency in buildings, and managing our tree canopy and green spaces to sequester more carbon. Without this role, we risk falling behind in meeting our climate goals and missing opportunities to build a more resilient community. This is a crucial moment for our city. By funding a climate manager, you are making an investment in the future of Lake Forest Park, a future where we can be leaders in climate action and protect our community for generations to come. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much, Tina Rhodes. Uh, Dana Campbell. Welcome, Dana. Yeah. Hello, Lake Forest Park Council and Mayor French. Uh, my name is Dana Campbell, and I've lived in Lake Forest Park for since 2012, and I currently serve as a volunteer on the Lake Forest Park Climate Action Committee as a member of the Lake Forest Park Streamkeepers team and on the advisory committee for the Lake Forest Park Water District. And I've been following this year's budget, budget process and wanted to register my hope for the city to dedicate funds for a staff climate manager position to support and implement climate actions that are so important for protecting our unusual and beautiful city. Um, as Tamara said, the um, acceptance of the recent climate action plan that we put forward uh, indicates that the city has a strong feeling for um, protecting our climate. And um, when the when the Climate Action Council put together that document, we realized after sorting through all of the information that the only way to really um, get all of it, implement all of the recommendations that we put into there is to prioritize the hiring of a dedicated climate manager. And if you look through the web pages from neighboring cities who do have climate managers, you'll see that um, they have secured many thousands of dollars in grants for climate actions and have created extensive programming for residents of those communities. And those neighboring cities are enthusiastic and eager to collaborate with Lake Forest Park. And our city has huge potential to lead in the security of our future. Um, but significant implementation of the goals that we have for climate simply cannot be done by citizen volunteers alone. So we hope that the city will realize that implementation commitments require the hiring of professional leadership. Um, on a related note, I wanted to just give you an indication for how much enthusiasm there is or how much um, participation there is in the community for uh, the climate, um, the members of the Climate Action Committee are putting together a um, project, which is a Lake Forest Park Climate Hub. And um, we've um, designed this as a large mural in the town commons, which uh, has been, the idea has been accepted by Merlin Geyer. Um, so you know that if they are accepting that kind of thing, this is an important um, topic. The um, proposal is to put up a large mural, brightly colored, and this is a, a very small image of it for you to look at, but I can send the document to you with the um, model that we have. It will go up on the wall behind third place books. It's a 20 foot long wall, like 12 feet high. And it's gonna be an interactive learning space for the community. So not only is it a mural, but it will have bulletin boards on it that will allow residents and passerbys of the general community to see what all of these wonderful 
actions that are going on in Lake Forest Park to preserve the environment and to deal with climate. Um, we also are pushing for a climate kiosk, and this would allow a actual uh, place to store educational packets and um, be a place where volunteers from the community and hopefully students from our high school can come and um, interact with the community in interactive um, 3D kind of props to talk about climate and get that uh, conversation really going in our community. So there's huge enthusiasm from this project, not just from Roland Geyer, but in the few days since it has been um, um, approved by Merlon Geyer, the uh, many places have stepped up to help with funding for this project. So it's really going and it's going fast. I just wanted to give you a heads up to look out for progress on this and to think also about what could be done if we actually had leadership within the, the council in our city to help promote these kinds of uh, agendas. Thank you very much. Uh, Anne Udeloy. Hi, Anne. Welcome. Thank you. Mayor French, council members, I'm Anne Udeloy, resident of Lake Forest Park for some decades now. And uh, by training and profession, of a geologist and hydrogeologist. Um, my colleagues on the Climate Action Council uh, Committee have, have spoken eloquently about our climate action plan, our recommendations, and what's been done by volunteers. Volunteer effort has brought a lot of this forward for you. However, we've reached a point where we really need engagement from the city. Some of these things cannot be brought forward any further without having dedicated staff who can ensure that projects move forward. I'm a huge believer in democracy in this government we have that is of, by, and for the people. Budgets are value statements. When you write the budget, what you're doing is you're saying, this is what we will do for our city in the next biennium and going forward. There has been a climate action plan before ours. It was not a bad plan. It was actually a pretty good plan. And it got put on a shelf and nothing happened. And when our team came together first as volunteers within the community, then under the auspices of the city's uh, climate action committee, we found that old plan and it's unimplemented recommendations. That's what happens if the city cannot staff up and have somebody who is dedicated to implementing the plan. The time to do this was actually 20 plus years ago. As a geologist, I've been watching this unfolding disaster. Not a day goes by where we do not learn of another climate disaster. Right now, Panhandle, Florida, the Big Bend area, is seeing a Category 4 come on shore. That was a tropical storm at the other end of the Gulf of Mexico, and it went up to Category 4 as it's making landfall. It's 400 miles wide. One of many storms, but we did not have storms like this when I was a kid. We really did not. None of us, however, have ever lived in a time when climate change Human-induced climate change has not affected our planet. It's just getting worse. We have to act. We have to act on the large level, globally, but also on the local level. It's our responsibility. This is what our community would like to do with our taxes. We ask that you budget for it and use our money so that the government of the people and by the people does the work for the people that the people are asking you to do. Please, let's implement this plan and have a climate manager within the city staff. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Appreciate your comments. Let's see, and Sarah Phillips. Welcome, Sarah. There's a show and tell here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just wanted to share with you, I don't know if you did I don't know if you can see this. This is from one of the things that we did in um, in uh, uh, the climate action plan was to 
have conversations with people. We thought that was a critical piece. This was a conversation we had at Picnic in the Park, where we asked people, how did they, where do they stand on climate action? And as you can see, they clustered on, uh, that most people were alarmed or concerned. Um, and, and this is a, a these are uh, people we saw in, in Picnic in the Park. It, and it represents what we've seen before. I know the uh, Citizen Climate Action brought you the same poster a year ago, a couple of meetings ago, and we thought it was such a great activity. We decided to do it again because it occasions uh, conversations. And I'm like Anne, I was listening to the weather report before we came here. They said that that hurricane is unsurvivable if you're in the path, that the tides are going to be 20 feet tall and push 20 miles inland. That's sort of a symbol for me of what kind of catastrophes could happen. In one sense, we're so lucky because we live in a fabulous place. But we all remember the uh, uh, wildfire smoke. We remember staying inside, having to keep your kids inside instead of outside. We know there's asthma, um, and that's a climate issue. And it's particularly an issue with our children, increasing numbers of cases of asthma. What we need to do is not a surprise. Um, and it's sort of when you look at um, this chart and you say to yourself, where would I put my pen? I'm assuming because you accepted the climate action report that you would be either concerned or very concerned. And so the question is, what action are you gonna take? I just want to say parenthetically, this is a fabulous committee of smart people and uh, what a resource we have in the city of Lake Forest Park to bring this to your attention. But it is, it, it is not something, the role of volunteers is different from the role of a manager. A manager is single focused uh, during the workday on a particular issue. And that's what we think we need. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. This time, is there anyone else that would like to make public comment in sitting here in the council chambers? Calvin? <laughs> <laughs> Just checking. Oh, okay, with that, we'll close public comment. Thank you everyone who made such eloquent comments tonight. Uh, we're moving on to presentations. Um, Director, sorry, Administrator Hill, we have the active transportation plan just one second. So I've got two parts. I have an interactive map I want to share with you. So I've got to share my screen and then a presentation to follow. So okay, sure. Thank you, sir. Okay, I'm glad you all have screens in front of you because that is not showing as well as I would have hoped to for the public. Um, so what we have here is an interactive map. This is, um, Director Perigo has been working with Transpo Group to produce this. This is every bit of data that we have related to traffic and um, traffic safety has been produced um, over the last several years. Um, this first layer that you're looking at is all of the data that Director Perigo um, he and um, consultants drove every street in the city using road AI and collected the data throughout the, the city. And so what you're seeing in this layer is the condition, the pavement condition index across the city. So you can see up in the northeast corner, we've got around Horizon View, a large um, collection of roads that are um, in poor shape, um, some around Lake Forest Park Elementary, uh, some over Goat Trail area, and then in the middle of the city. So you, you get an idea of the data that's been collected. Um, I'm gonna just hit some of the highlights. We can turn on this layer. I'm gonna turn off the road network just so you can see it more clearly. And this is this layer indicates where we have sidewalks in purple and where we have um, pathways in blue. So we have that data on as well. Um, can leave that one on. We also have collected See, I knew I needed my mouse, but it wouldn't Bluetooth. Well, I can't really show you the, the, 
right away, but if you get into the details, and I will send you a link to this with the password so you can get online and play with it. You can't hurt it. It's, you know, we're locked out from the outside. We can't change the data. <laughs> but in conjunction with seeing the roads and the condition they are, and then this layer shows you the width of, of the asphalt, or actually the width of the um, right-of-way that we own within the city. And then there's another um, detail in here, if I can find it really quick. I don't know if it goes into it on this one. Um, I'm going to have trouble finding it, but I've got it in the presentation. We also know the pavement width. Not only do we know the condition, but we know the actual pavement width, so we can have an understanding of what we can do with the existing width of asphalt and where we would need to add, say, if we want to add pathways. And so I just wanted to walk this through you this really quickly. Um, you can also add vehicle crashes um, represented by the white dots, that's from 2019 through 2024, but like, based off data that's been collected throughout the city. So just wanted to quickly give you an idea of where all this information is stored, the types of information that we've um, collected. We've also included the, um, the mobility projects. So we have um, tier one and tier two, these are from safe streets and the recommendations that came out of those. And we'll walk through this in a little bit more detail in the presentation because it gets really messy on this map. And so I'm going to shop, stop sharing screen and ask Matt to throw the presentation up and we will walk through that also. Wait for meeting. Okay. So this is titled Active Transportation Plan, and this has two pieces, obviously. We've always had the, I'm not sure why that's jumping. Are you doing that, Matt? Um, we've, always, we've always had the issue of needing to maintain our existing infrastructure, our roads. And then on top of that, we have the need to address mobility and not just by bicyclists, people walking, strollers, whatever it is, any type of transportation. And so we've We've taken this from an email that Council Member Riddle sent out about having a context around the region, using the same language across regions. And this is something that came out of UDOT is, you know, we've called it multimodal transportation. Act transportation seems to be what's being used in the industry. So we're gonna we're gonna hop on that bandwagon. So the map that you just saw, obviously the road surface condition, right-of-way mapping, um, anything that's in red is in poor shape and should be replaced. Um, Based on the data that we have in here, as far as um, you know, road conditions, asphalt width, uh, taking a look at geographically, as we've talked in the past for asphalt replacement, anytime you do a project, you want all your projects kind of in one area. So you, we contract with King County. We don't want them up in this corner and then down over here and, and bouncing around the city. It adds exorbitant costs to the project um, and can delay projects getting done. And so, I'm gonna jump right into what we're proposing in this CIP to be the next project. Um, and this shows up really well on that, that background for that screen, but this is the Northeast corner up around Horizon View. Um, as we've looked at it geographically, um, kind of an area that we haven't really focused on, you know, putting in trails, pathways, et cetera, an area that we get a lot of complaints about um, especially around Horizon View, we've had a lot of requests for traffic calming, speed signs, you know, what can we do? We don't have a safe walking path. And, and just looking at it geographically in one area, based on the data that we've collected, this is the area that we recommend in the 25-26 biennial budget for the overlay program, which would include, because we have, it, you can see the numbers up there, those numbers on those rights away are the asphalt width that exists today. We need a minimum of 28 feet of asphalt to put in the six foot that it takes to get in the walkway as, long, as well as the extruded curb. And then that leaves us 22 feet of asphalt, uh, 11 feet in each direction for passage of vehicles. And then we would also include ADA ramps. I can't tell you tonight how many lane miles or three quarters of lane miles that we could get done in this area. But based on kind of a very high level equity analysis, looking at the city, as a whole where we haven't done a lot of work, where we've heard a lot of concern and where we know we need to take care of our roads, we recommend this section for the 25-26 um, CIP budget. So I'm gonna hop into the next part. I'm gonna leave that. 
and go into the existing studies and talk about more of the active transportation and what we think should be the next steps for the city. We've got, um, we heard it earlier tonight, we've got plans sitting on the shelf. We haven't had the the assets. We haven't had the cash flow to pick off a lot of these projects. We've done them bit by bit slowly. And so the recommendation, this map here shows you the um, tier one and tier two projects from the safe streets study. Tier one are in the yellowish orange color, tier two are in the greenish color. And I'll note that one of the tier two projects is part of the CIP um, program that we're recommending for this year, um, but we'll get a little, little bit more detail. So safe street study tier one is around Brookside Elementary, permanent speed warning signs, which we have been doing, we continue to do. Um, Lake Forest Park Elementary walkways, Briarcrest Elementary, and then Northeast 178th um, completion of what has been begun there. Um, so as we just hop into this, this just shows the tier one projects on here. Um, we'll, walk, we'll zoom in a little bit more detail. So around Brookside Elementary, obviously Brookside Boulevard and 178th are included in those tier um, one projects. Um, up into a little jump. Lake Forest Park Elementary, the um, road that you can barely see from here in the orange highlight, that section has been completed with um, extruded curb, curb walkways for the entire length. The one down at the bottom, just above where it says Lake Forest Park Elementary, a small segment of that has been completed. Everything else in that area does not have walkways or has very intermittent walkways that aren't connected and aren't completed. The asphalt widths in these areas would support um, being able to come in, overlay what we have existing, and to um, implement walkways within it. And then when we get to Briarcrest Elementary, um, it's, it's the full meal deal here. We've got to do the walkways throughout, but the right of way for the most part supports it. This would require a little bit more on the ground kind of evaluation of what's going on on the ground where it maybe says 26 or 27 feet. What's really going on there? I'm shaking a little bit. I'm even cold too. <laughs> I'm not normally cold. Um, and so that that's why we've collected all this data. So we can really have you know some data-driven analysis of what we should do and how we can implement it in areas that have already been set as a priority by the city. The thing that council will need to do at this point is, are the priorities still the same? Um, Safe Street Study Tier 2 is 37th Avenue Northeast, Calming, Perkins Way, North Area Connections, 55th Avenue. I get asked a lot about 55th Avenue Northeast because we own half the road and Kenmore has the other half and their residents are screaming for something to get done up there. And then Northeast 187th and 47th Avenue, which is part of that area that I showed you for the CIP in the upcoming biennium. And there's just a highlight of the, the tier two projects. And this, I'll send all this to you. And so, no drapes, anything. The mayor's proposed budget for this year recommends hiring a project manager for, N, for NPDES. We've talked about that a lot. We talked about it earlier tonight. There's so much work that just that one senior project manager does that we kind of have a, a twofold approach. We can either hire an NPDES um, project manager completely in that fund, and we will have to have some deliberations on how that occurs and the rates and what the implications are there. Or you can leave that work with the current senior project manager and hire another project manager that's funded by the new revenue sources to deal with active transportation. And what do we mean by active transportation? It would be first, well, not first, coordinate on the right with public works pavement management projects on active transportation enhancements. So work hand in hand with whoever our new superintendent is and our director to make sure that as they're doing those CIP overlays that where we can, we install walkways. If some design's required, we've got somebody there. We also have a revenue source that in these new revenues where professional services could be brought in to help design that. And on the other end, to help deliver 10% engineer drawings for safe street tier one projects so we can go start going out to PSRC, et cetera, to get funding so that it's all not city funded. 
And so that is the recommendation, one, to cover our CIP with our standard $800,000 that we put in for overlays, but to also deliver the walkways that we can when we're doing those projects and also start delivering on existing priorities um, from our safe streets projects. And I think, uh, oh, let's stop there. And then I have some updates from some questions that were asked at previous council meetings. So thank you, Minister Hill. Yeah, please. Uh, when looking at road width, you you talked about, you know, the two two car lanes and then how much you would need for like um, a pedestrian walkway. Are you also considering some like additional just, you know, extra on the edges in the event that there's like a ditch or something so that we have some some fluff? It's our typical sure shy that, we... that you go. Is it six? Is it a foot a shy for your your shoulder? Shoulder. Yeah. Twenty-eight. Okay, so yeah, you've got you've got two over here. So you've got your five foot okay. for your walkway, and then one on the other side. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Vice Chair for Tony. <clears throat> Thanks for the presentation. It was very clear. Um, I really appreciate that GIS tool, and I do apologize for missing the beginning of your presentation. But you'll send that link out. I will. Okay. It, it, I'll send you an email. It has the link in it, and then looking at it, it's got a username and password. Just drop it in and. Mm -hmm. Tell it to remember you. And you'll be there good for good. Thanks. Um, can I, you may have to you. Um, one unrelated question then. Um, as you've heard, uh, either Brookside or Lake Forest Park Elementary might be slated for closure. Probably more Brookside than LFP Elementary. How would you know? I, I guess the question is, um, when does the ten percent design decision need to be made? keeping in mind that it may be the case where we're going to actually be funding something that there aren't going to be students walking along. I think any decision from the school district is going to come before we get to that point. If council adopts this, approves the budget, and we move into 2025, we're going to have to fill positions, et cetera. But uh, I wouldn't, if there's some impending doom for Brookside that we're kind of waiting on, I wouldn't go out and allocate dollars to to study something that may change. But then you also, there, there's a fair amount of foot traffic around there. It, it is an access point to Animal Acres Park and to um, the Brookside Park. And so it, while it wouldn't be a school priority, I think it would still be a priority. Okay, thanks. Just for clarity, Lake Forest Park was removed from the list uh, in the spring. So Brookside is still on the list of four schools remaining for consideration for closure. Deputy Mayor Bodie. Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much. I just want to say thank you. This is exactly at one of our previous meetings, what I was hoping for and looking for in the way of uh, a data-driven approach. Um, I really appreciate the GIS mapping and layers, uh, which we can add to and enhance in the future. Um, I just think this was a great presentation and a, and a really strong basis for us going forward with these projects. So I'm. Um, uh, this, is, this is something new that's been developed um, by Public Works and Transpo, and the presentation was really excellent too. So I just wanted to um, be, you know, express my appreciation because I was, this is, this is exactly the kind of thing that uh, I and some fellow council members were looking for. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Rapoti. Colleagues, other, uh, uh, let's go with Larry first. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks. Uh, in regard to the overlay, um, I do appreciate that you came at it from not just a pavement condition standpoint, but also looking at neighborhood equity. I'd like us actually to go a little bit further and in the future have more of like a, a rubric in, of some sense that actually looks at, you know, how many, like what is the waiting for roadway conditions? What is the waiting for neighborhood? And do we look at how long has it been since the city has built something there? Do we look at average income levels? So I'd actually like, like to see us go a little bit more robust in terms of how we're evaluating where to go next. But I think this is definitely a good first step. And as I was looking at the map today preparing, um, I think one thing that we could easily add are um, census tracts. You know, we have a few in them. We only have one up kind of in the, it's actually in the Northwest corner that um, has a little bit lower income um, disparity there. So I think, yeah, there's some layers that we could definitely add to it as we evaluate in the future. 
Thank you, colleagues. Councilmember Lebo. So um, thank you. I think this is a good start. And to um, council members' comments, I think with this idea of a rubric, there also needs, to, I think, be additional layers, uh, such as um, connections for bicyclist um, trails, uh, as well as our public transportation. So for example, on 38th Avenue New York, Northeast and uh, Bothell Way, it's not a safe way to get to the bus stop which is gonna be part of Sound Transit's um, stride program at 153rd. There are other areas, for example, there's not safe access to the Bergelman Trail at about 146th, 48th. Mm -hmm. So we need to give consideration uh, to overlaying these with additional um, elements that enhance our uh, mobility. There used to be sharrows on the roads in terms of how you might access um, the Bergelman Trail from other parts of Lake Forest Park, as well as the school district has identified what are primary uh, travel routes for children to school. And so these kinds of things, along with a rubric that helps us understand how we might achieve our best value for the dollars that we spend based upon the condition and other elements that we have that we want to encourage, I think is the next step. I think we're just sort of scratching the surface here. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And, you know, thinking about the, the interurban connector and, and tying all that together. But yeah, your point's well made on the, the transportation and, and how we connect to that as well. So um, there, are, transportation. there are robust civil engineers in Lake Forest Park who work on these in terms <laughs> of alternatives. I mean, Northeast 55th is an example where filling in the ditch and a curb there would go a long way to making that just something that I, I've seen people walk on it and they're basically walking on the fog line because on one side there's traffic and on the other side there's a ditch mm -hmm. and uh, just filling in that ditch would actually make that much safer for people to get there so the other is to encourage maybe getting a program with perhaps one of our local universities like the university of washington they could help come in and, and map some of this information that we have because um you know it would be a great learning opportunity for them and an opportunity for us to fill in information that create a real robust program. A rubric as uh, council member Goldman, I think is important for us to establish uh, what are really good patterns. As you point out, 37th along Brookside, uh, it's not just children, it's uh, a lot of pedestrian traffic there. And they're only separated by a fog line and not a very good area. I've walked it. <laughs> oh. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Uh, yes, yeah. that's where we're good. I'd like to see the footage of the segments. And if you add the footage of the segments, can't you budget for that? I mean, isn't that a, a way that you budget this cost of actually implementing the work? So like for the CIP that we do in the upcoming biennium. Yeah, so we, that um, if that is something that council was to adopt it's as acceptable in the CIP, then we would work with the county to go out um, really truly evaluate how much work's going to be done. You know, are there soft spots in the road? Is it just mill and overlay or someone going to have to be dug up and base replaced? Get into a detail and see how far we our $800,000 takes us um, if it requires more. And this is a discussion. In the past, we've had $800,000. And when you hit the end of that, you were done for the year. We have a new revenue source. That opens up a discussion. Um, you know, the mayor's proposed budget puts, uh, I think, an, another one hundred and fifty thousand dollars per year into the early actions side of things. As we start to get a better handle on what revenues might look like, we can start programming more to get get more done more quickly. I guess what I what I'm saying is, I don't know how you estimate the cost of actually doing the work in each of those segments. And I don't know if it is the length of the roadway or what factors go into it, but it's, perhaps, you know, putting something to it that you would allow you to say, okay, this section costs this, this, this section costs that, and then you could prioritize. So as the county comes in and evaluates this, that's exactly what happens okay. is how much each section is going to cost based on what's going on on the ground and how poor of shape um, you lose the base, it's it's a lot of work. You know, if you're just milling overlaying, it's a lot cheaper. You know, it's a tenth the price to just mill and overlay as opposed to a complete replacement. But I, I, I but really we, appreciate we can get that information for you. Yes. Yeah, it's great. Thank you. Yeah, because we're riddled. Yes, please. Yeah, and I think this this does sort of show where the GIS really comes in as providing us the relevant detail to be able to make decisions, especially if we 
do uh, as council member um Lebo. Lebo. Wow, it's late. <laughs> Your neighbor. <laughs> I was gonna say John. <laughs> like I should be more formal. Yeah. And then I forgot. Okay, anyways, um, as you mentioned that we have, um, you know, we have more data that we actually know now, like the, the school's preferred routes. So there's some low hanging fruit that we can continue to add to this. Um, I think what I'm gonna want from administration is, is what are our barriers to really taking this to where it needs to be, if there are any, you know, because this GIS op option is, is great, but it's only, as Councilmember Lebo said, it's only taken it so far, we only scratched the surface. So what is it gonna to take to make this a deep enough bench of information that we can really utilize it? Honestly, get Public Works fully staffed, I think is is the first step. Um, I, I think as Director Perigo was putting together his presentation for tonight, the one that really jumped out at me was slide yeah. seven and the time that mm -hmm. we've only had one project manager in the past three years. It's kind of pathetic. Um, makes it really hard to get things done. And then um, I'll get on my soapbox, you ask, you know, <laughs> splitting out that senior project manager duties, finding a way, whether it's within the stormwater facilities and you charge it there or some new revenues and do it over in the, the general fund side, 002, your new fund, splitting that up. And so that we can really have a true focus on getting some capital projects done. The one thing that I've we've dealt with time and again in the six years that I've been here is just the dollars haven't been there. And now I think the dollars are gonna be there. Now we just need to make sure that we have the appropriate amount of staff to bring those forward and move them along. Um, and then we'll rely on consultants because you don't wanna hire a specified expertise you know, mm -hmm. when you don't need them year round. Follow-up question? Go right ahead. Have, have you talked about having like a uh, maybe like a GIS consultant just kind of like on retainer like the way that we do with our engineers. Transpo is that for us. That's what they do. Yes and they day. have they're actually their senior um, GIS specialist I'll call him because I don't know his title was left and there was a transition and they have somebody who is working under him is amazing and produces stuff quickly and so we are relying heavily on them at this point in time and we always have. We've had some GIS interns mm -hmm that have come in and done you know, their three months stand under University of Washington, got, gathered us some data with the Trimble and off they go. And then we give it to Transpo or they've taken some time to put it into the system, but that's how we've lived as far as GIS. Thank you. I'd like to other questions for Administrator Bell. I just wanted to follow up just quickly about the RCW and this is partially for, for everyone's reminder, reminder for our colleagues here, but also for the public that revenues generated from these new camera installations can only be used for certain purposes, specifically for complete streets as this defined in the state statutes. So if you have a moment taking a look at that, the requirements of the RCW that gives us the authority for those cameras. The other thing uh, to uh, Council Member Goldman's question or comment about equity, uh, equity, one of the other things that it does require is that we uh, <clears throat> these revenues have to be spent also in an equitable manner within census tracts that are normally underserved. Um, and so I think that that is a very critical thing. Fortunately, in our community, we have a very small, small community. So we're, we're our projects, many of them will touch on many, many different areas, but we have had requests for crosswalks in certain areas in the Northern part of the city, as well as um, some additional curbage, some various other things for pedestrian safety. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to um, facilitate those things as soon as possible. Hey, Matt, can you make the slide bigger again? So, no, nope, don't get rid of it. That was my head. <laughs> um, I shaved today. This, this is, uh, I just want to address some questions that came up on Monday night after our discussion just on road safety. There's a question of, well, saying we, you know, we're anticipating this much revenue. You keep throwing out all these costs. How does it all drop down? So, um, estimated annual revenue um, from the new traffic cameras is estimated at $4 million per year. This is in your mayor's proposed budget, so you have a copy of that. Um, estimated annual fees. And so each one of the cameras um, that we pay to Vera Mobility is $4,911.50, so times two. And then that fee gets us the first 400 citations. After that, we pay $5 per citation beyond 400. 
we're anticipating, and thanks to the chief for putting some numbers together based off of current rates coming in, about 2,373 citations per month. Um, hence the request from the police department and courts for the additional staff as those ramp up times by 12. I can no longer read the, anyway, it's 260,000 roughly. Um, then net revenue at about 3.7 million. And then I've given you the um, two FTEs in police value, the FTE in court value, and then the project manager active transportation. Now, this is if you don't hire the NPDS person. If, if you don't hire that, we would need an active transportation and then we would free up the existing project manager to do safe streets, mobility, active transportation and those regular projects, but we would um, hand off to a new project. They would keep that and then we'd hand off the active transportation. Anyway, it's a dollar amount regardless of where it goes. If you were to hire a new NPDS person under the stormwater, then we would allocate a proportional share of the new revenues to the existing senior project manager who would take on those duties. And so roughly you're left with about $3.2 million a year to do um, other things. Uh, as far as timing, that was the other thing that came up, um, the up to two FTEs and the police, we would advertise those in the first quarter of 2025, roughly. Yeah. This is still something that we have not um, bargained with the guild. Um, we don't know what they will feel. We're, we're thinking that two will get it done. That's based off the chief's numbers. They may have a different idea. Um, and that time frame is by December 2nd of this year. If they wish to, wish to bargain that, they will give us notice that they would like to bargain that. And then we will um, go through that process and see if it's two more, less, um, you know, that they're, they're looking for. Um, project manager, active transportation, as I said, depending on how we put that together, we'll have a lot more discussion on that. That'll either be for a new position or offsetting some costs of the existing position if the um, stormwater went into the stormwater fund. And then as far as the timing on the two FTEs for the court, um, so they've requested one off the bat just to cover existing workload. Um, and then their two ads would be when we hit 3,500 to 5,000 citations per month. And then if we went over 5,000, they would want a second. And I think they would probably scale that up if we continue to add traffic cameras and add workload. I believe that's the end of my presentation. Any questions on this? Then I will send all this to you. Um, so tying together a couple of the things we talked about just now, um, I looked it up and so the Shoreline School District is meeting next week. They're going to take two of the four remaining schools and mark them as safe. And then there will be two finalists, one of which is likely closed. In the event Brookside is closed, what happens to the cameras? The cameras would remain the 24-7, well, their school walk zone cameras. Good question. Um, because their school walk zone cameras, um, they they we would have to we would have to evaluate that. Um, I think we'd have to, if I may, yes. Mr. Hill. I think we'd have to look at it programmatically. Just a reminder: the school walk zone, as defined by the RCW, is a one mile, one mile radius, one mile, which covers. If you look at both of the schools, it covers almost two thirds of our community. So I think that we'd have to reevaluate. Those children are still going to be walking if they're going to Briarcrest or they're going to be going to uh, Lake Forest Park Elementary uh, per se. There would still, I think we'd have to look at it programmatically and see what would, what would make sense. Um, there's other authority that we could utilize in the same, uh, as, there as well, but we would definitely have to reevaluate it from the standpoint. Our fervent hope is that, of course, that locally we don't lose a school, but we mm -hmm. never know. So it's an excellent question. Colleagues, other questions for Mr. Hill? Did you? Uh... Okay. Thank you very thank, much. Thank Joel. you. It's great work. Okay. Um, let's see, where are we? And uh, we're moving on to Director Hoffman, the 2024 Lake Forest Park Comprehensive Plan update. I, uh, I know you're very happy about this, Mark. <laughs> it should be. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Mark Hoffman, Community Development Director. This presentation is short and simple. The binder you have before you is the transmittal of the draft comprehensive plan update. 
Good night. <laughs> <laughs> now comes the hard part. Um, where do we go from here? And so I, I put together a couple slides. Um, half are an introduction. We'll, we'll start with where, where we're at, where it's back. So two things tonight, the, the status, and then um, start to talk about the framework and guidance. I have a feeling the council has seen this. If you've dived into the planning commission material at all, you have seen that. Um, I've seen it so many times. I don't re recall whether Christina of SEJ or I have included in slides updates with you, but it's pervasive throughout the effort and we're reminded to include it at all times. So to start off, the simple status is, um, this is the beginning of the city council review and comments or amendments. The binder you have does not have track changes. It represents the, the current draft as of this hour of the, the effort. How did we get here? Uh, as you know, two-year effort. Uh, last year, much visioning work, mission work, uh, outreach with uh, SCJ Alliance. And then I arrived in January. And since January, the Planning Commission has been holding special meetings in addition to the regular meetings going through each of the elements um, and both volumes. Volume one is uh, consists of all the required elements, all the, all the uh, voluntary elements. Volume two is the, the background information, facts. Uh, and the intent is to make the vision, mission, goals, policies clear and um, uh, reachable in volume one without getting buried in a bunch of background information as to the why. Uh, and so the the public hearing was held at the Planning Commission, wasn't well attended, um, um, but it ended a long effort. On September 10th, the Planning Commission made some final revisions and edits and some comments. At the end of that night, they, they adopted a motion to recommend this draft to the City Council. Ideally, the city council would uh, take it from this point through December of 2024 and take action. The planning commission's work is just a recommendation. It's quite extensive and, and it touches on every part of the comprehensive plan. Uh, there, the, the binder you have is that document. There are two other things contained in that. They, uh, the planning commission wanted to transmit a cover letter along with it. Um, with a little background. Uh, it was also described that it would be helpful to reflect on or convey issues or items that were not necessarily a consensus. What did they struggle with? And so that second document in your binder is that document. They're also willing to attend a joint workshop with the city council uh, at some point, um, if it works out with your schedules and, and uh, uh, city workloads. Uh, the chair and vice chair are also available at any point to answer specific questions, give flavor, context, et cetera. Uh, some things, th this is a working draft. Some things are not in there. In fact, today I met the chair. There is now a glossary. And I don't think I put it in there. I did not. <laughs> and the reason I bring it up is you always struggle with what is the document? Should it be in paper? Why can't it just be a link on the website? It is a link on the website. Uh, we're directing most questions and interactions to that website and are gonna continue to populate it. We think this document and this effort are important enough uh, and we don't have a lot of time. This binder would help you with your comments, even those that are strictly electronic, uh, instead of asking who wants paper and electronic, we went full paper and full electronic. Um, where we take it from here, we intend to fulfill whatever needs you have and augment this binder. I'll, I'll distribute additional paper copies and electronic. First example, the, the working glossary uh, or implementation measures or anything that is generated at city council. So you don't, you, you don't have to carry lug this around with you. We will recycle it when this effort is done uh, and can add anything to it that you want. Uh, in the PowerPoint that you have, there are also other examples. Further information for capital facilities and utilities has been giving, given to uh, the consultant. 
and it's being worked in. So it's not fully reflected in the draft you have, but it's being worked on actively. The idea being that that catches up at some point before the council starts to consider the full document. Uh, oh, one suggestion, the yellow highlighted uh, uh, area from Christina. She also wants to zhuzh this up a little bit. So as you go through and you see some very familiar pictures, <laughs> that's not the intent. They're, they're task included with their contract is to come to the community, get a fresh look, fresh perspective, capture it in photos, and put that into the new document. So the yellow highlight is if you have any suggestions, unique perspectives, um, uh, angles, or uh, locations that capture the local character. Um, and since you're longtime residents here and know that better than anyone, if you have any suggestions, get them to me, that team could go there. If it's top secret or a secret fishing spot, don't give it to me. <laughs> you don't want it in this binder. Uh, and so the second part tonight, I don't want to go into too much detail. And some of this you may already have. Uh, and it's the legislative changes and why we're doing this and the layers of this effort, um, but also the equity lens. And... I'm sure you've seen this diagram if you dive into any of the presentations, but the exhibit is intended to show the layers. Growth Management Act at the state level, Washington State Growth Management Act. So whether it is uh, House Bill, oh man, it's too late in the day for this, <laughs> House Bill 1220, and that the community must plan for and accommodate all economic segments of the community amendment to the GMA, that's that level. Uh, House Bill 1337 with ADUs, House Bill 1110 with mental housing, that's that layer. So we need to be in conformance with that layer. How we do it is the local effort. The next layer is Puget Sound Regional Council. Their primary document is Vision 2050. That's the regional transportation plan primarily. At the, at the end of this, our local comprehensive plan goes back to Puget Sound Regional Council for certification. The legal status is they have overview over the transportation portions of this document, um, but there are other areas that pertain to that regional document, Vision 2050, so that's important. The next layer is countywide. King County, uh, countywide planning policies. You can look at that as the comprehensive plan of, of King County, but it's slightly different. It's how the cities and the county work together. We need to be consistent with that as well. Primary element of this, of the, I'm trying not to use acronyms either, countywide planning policies is the growth targets, housing and jobs growth targets. Ours is 870 units to 2044. Um, the, the inner or most important, I could say, um, level of this exhibit is Lake Forest Park. That's the local vision, the local character, the community values, the community mission, goals and policies uh, that you and the community find important. Uh, and that is the primary part of this update. While we need to be consistent with the changes in the other three and, and uh, comply with them, the local effort in this update to bring this document to, through 2044 is that inner circle, the light green. If you haven't seen this before, what this document, and you've gone through this with the climate action plan, this is not an implementation plan. It will have an implementation chapter or sub element um, that SEJ is working on, um, but it, it captures the vision and mission and then goals and policies that implement that. The implementation chapter would make this a living document. Everything else is drawn from there, whether it's budget decisions, staffing decisions, CIP, those are all much different in character. This is the high level um, uh, marching orders for the community to guide decisions. So in that context, when discussions are had, lots of subjects come up, but as far as amendments to this document, the, the meaning of a vision or goal, policy or action is very important. So this matrix we carry along with us to help with those discussions. Um, the last one is 
uh, require because of the changes at the state, county, and regional level. Uh, it was a topic uh, talked about quite a bit at Planning Commission, well received at Planning Commission, difference of opinion. It is captured in the annotated memo that you have in accompanying with this. Um, the, the greater need in this round with the Growth Management Act changes uh, requires an equity lens in these decision uh, decisions on policy. And I so, think Deputy Mayor Bodhi has a question. Lori, I apologize. I did not. I was focused on that. Yes, going back to the previous um, conversation, uh, Mark, I had a question. Um, the implementation chapter, does that have to be part of what we approve by December? Or um, is that something that can um, be postponed to later? Because I'm mindful of the fact that certain things are still being worked on. So uh, I was trying to um, figure out uh, um, how to manage the workload, to be honest, of uh, council review, because this is a brand new document. Um, we have newer council members and I'm mindful of the kind of effort that it took to update the town center code um, or even the last effort to update the comprehensive plan. So my question was specifically, um, the implementation chapter, can that be segmented off and done later? I, I think it can for two reasons. One, it's not done. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we have a short period of time. And I say that in the context of you may not be aware, our, our primary contact at SCJ took another job with another consulting firm. We made it through this phase, fortunately, um, but she is a very valuable resource. That's an example of further work that would have been ideal to be captured in here and done. It's not required to be in here. You can adopt this document without an implementation chapter. The intent is that this doesn't just go sit on a shelf, as they say. Sure. The implementation is what do you do the first year? What do you focus on? What the second year? Now, the key is we have Christina through, not through an agreement or contract with us. S SCJ is aware of the difficulty that puts their clients in. They are going to contact contract with the other consultant and we will have access to uh, Christina's um, we will have her as a resource through December mm -hmm. if in that time period we can't get to the implementation chapter that's fine there are no rules or regulations requiring it to be in there I would love to keep working on it in that context now the safety net is we have the climate element uh, coming this is a 10-year eight year, now 10 year periodic update. Every year you get to dock in and do the voluntary uh, and one update to your comp plan. We're gonna do that for climate element, um, but we could add other items to that. That could be a catch up in that effort. That's helpful. Um, can you remind me again of uh, the sequence of council deadlines and the actions that we have? Uh, so I know we have to take action in December, but I also presume there are some things we have to do before we can uh, have final adoption. Can you can you remind us of that sequence and then and then feel free to go into the equity discussion, which is really important. Thank you. Uh, primarily, consider the recommendation of the Planning Commission and review their work. Um, I would not say that it is starting from scratch. Thank you for your work. Now we'll take it from here and do our amendment. Good work has been done. So I characterize it as a review of that work and it's extensive. Please go through each element, uh, review each amendment, and but not necessarily wordsmith each and every one. The work is good. Um, but focus on areas of your concern. Logistically, a public hearing is required at the city council. Um, more public notice, um, as much public comment as we can get. Uh, and so that'll take up some of that time before a resolution is offered at city council and then that agendize for potential action. There's the, the, the deliverables for the grant associated with this were done last June. We were reimbursed. Now the SCJ contract runs through the end of December. So we will have that resource through then. Beyond that, you have us. 
which is not bad. Um, but I'm hoping not to go that far. I so do we have that. to complete the public hearing and any other uh, steps and adopt the comprehensive plan by when? Ideally by December 31st, 2024. Okay. So working back from that, when would a when could a public hearing occur? That that's going to be a function of the workload of the council. I know you're talking about budget. Yeah, I'm I'm You'll starting to formulate a, a schedule, looking from now to the end of December, and having a panic attack. You know, so. <laughs> Either way, it's um, it's a function I mean, of your ideally schedule. Ideally, we'd have the public hearing on a council recommendation or council tentative decision in early to mid-December, right? I'm available any day that you <laughs> <laughs> Okay. You, you, in other words, you don't have kind of a timeline that you're proposing for us. Uh, you're uh, 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 that, Anyway, I that that was my question. Thank you. <laughs> we can, you know, if if given the direction to come up with a potential yeah. and get feedback incorporated in a joint workshop with uh, planning commission. We've already talked to them about potential dates for a joint session in October. These circumstances have changed, but we could do so, a temp. So what I do envision from my past experience is that. The council will review each section. There are 10 sections. Not all of them will require as much review. Um, usually, I would imagine that we would go page by page to see if council members have changes or questions or additions they want to make as, as a kind of a procedural approach. And then uh, we would make the revisions that we make uh, mindful of what we heard from the community survey, what's in the appendices, and um, what we've gotten from the Planning Commission, of course, because they've done extensive and excellent work. But the council has an independent responsibility to take a look at this. So I guess I'm, I'm just warning my colleagues that you really need to read the whole document and the appendices and the community survey and the Planning Commission recommendations very soon and uh, be prepared for to have your comments ahead of council meetings um, when we're working on this um, because this is this is such a short time frame for such an important document that's completely new. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Sorry. Well to get on my soapbox, but I, I <laughs> this morning, uh, as the mayor knows, this morning I started to have a, a bit of anxiety about this. That is perfectly okay, Lori. I did as well. That's why I brought it up earlier today. And I was like, looking at the calendar thinking, oh my, there's a lot of work to be done here. Yes. I looked at the fact that we have four regular <laughs> meetings, four work sessions or cows, and two special meetings, which are supposedly dedicated to budget between now and um, December 12th. That's it. <laughs> so if we had a public hearing on December 12th, that would take out a work, a work session and a regular council meeting. So then that would be two less, only eight. So this is, this is a lot of work. So that's what I was, uh, I was starting to do the math. <laughs> yeah, Councilor Levo, thanks. I, I very much appreciate uh, Council Member or um, Deputy Mayor Brody's comments with regard to the level of work that's needed for this. I would offer just a slightly different approach and that was that we think of this as sort of a policy approach um, but by the council and that um, there are many ways to write a document. And um, we can sometimes argue over whether it should be an Oxford comma or not. Mm -hmm. And I think <laughs> that uh, under most circumstances that uh, whether or not it's got a comma doesn't really change the meaning. We can argue about it. I would suggest that we take a much uh, higher sort of view of what we're doing to say that there's been a lot of talent uh, that's gone into this document and that um, as policymakers that we should 
take advantage of that opportunity and that our focus is really upon uh, as a policy procedure, not whether or not uh, how it's written. Uh, to think about that we're not necessarily doing a page turn, but that we are sort of talking about it at a much higher level. And I say that because um, as Deputy Mayor points out, there is a limited amount of time, but I think there's also great value when we actually take our role as policymakers and not editors. And that that does respect the sort of talent that we've engaged to develop this both on the professional as well as the volunteer level. And I think that sends a very powerful message when people sign up to do this work as volunteers, that we truly respect the effort that they put in there and that we're not necessarily wordsmithing um, what they're doing, but we're focused on something because we either see it's missing or that we really have a different perspective about what we wanna do in that area. And we're we're open to any wordsmithing, but I can I can attest that a lot of wordsmithing was done. Now, for the with the exception of the housing element, the uh, every other element, every other amendment uh, was seen, discussed, and purposefully worded. You may disagree with it, and we could change it. The idea of having Christina available through December, she physically made the changes. So while being in the room is one thing, making the changes another. And if the question comes, why is this sentence written that way? We, we need her brain. But I would offer that when we think about why the sentence is written that way is because we have a different perspective of what we think the policy might be rather than yeah. you could rework, re, right. reword that. So that maybe it's a little clearer in our minds and then we, we get away from it's clearer in our minds, but it was really clear to 14 other people who read it and I'm just confused. So um suggest that we shouldn't try and unconfuse me, but rather uh, take the, the advantage of what the work was already done and only focus on the really significant policy issues. Lord, just a moment. Let me check and see if there's anyone else that wanted to make a comment. Councilmember Goldman, and then Councilmember Bertani. Um, I like what both um, Councilmember Lebo and Deputy Mayor Bodhi said. I mean, I suppose I might propose a hybrid that if you look starting on page 17 of the packet or between the two orange pages in the binder, there are some sections, and I, I might be stealing your thunder on this, um, but there are some sections where comments have been made. I guess there was disagreement among the planning commission. So it seems like those are sections that as a council, we might pay particular attention to. And then the other sections, which were less controversial, we might focus on more of a high level, yeah, does this seem to be a policy that we like? So to focus our attention on the areas that have been flagged for us. Okay. Thank you, Larry. Uh, Mr. Furtani. Thank you. And I wanted to uh, thank you, Director Hoffman for your summary of what we're doing here and uh, for uh, Deputy Mayor for uh, trying to set a timeline. I agree with uh, Council Member Goldman about the hybrid approach. For instance, um, the, the first thing I looked at was the comments document that you so thoughtfully included in the packet, because I knew that those might be the ones where we have to look at it a little bit more carefully. And already, for instance, in policy EQ 6.3, the distinguishing between the dark skies uh, criteria versus the artificial light at night criteria, I have some thoughts on that. So <laughs> my, my point is that, yeah, I think this is the area where we're going to see a lot more of the um, robust discussion on how not just the wording, but also on the actual concept itself and what's correct. And that's that's really what I'd like to focus on. Deputy Mayor Bodhi. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I completely agree with everyone. Um, I don't think our interest is in uh, in wordsmithing. We are, after all, a policy body, and we have had good work done by very informed people. Um, in addition to the issues that the um, that the planning commission has flagged for us, I wanted to emphasize a point that um, Director Hoffman just made, which is they did not review the wording of the housing element. And uh, that uh, the housing section, and that is something that will be highly sensitive in our community that we'll have to take a look at. And as Councilmember Furatani says, there are some issues that uh, I think we, as individual or collective council members, may spot. Um, it still takes time and organized um, uh, scheduling. And so I, as deputy mayor, will be glad to work with Director Hoffman to 
uh, come up with some proposals for timeline and, and specifically what topics we would discuss when so you could do your homework ahead of time. Fair enough. Okay, so that we're all in agreement then. You guys will discuss the hard parts and the easy ones will run through chat GPT. <laughs> uh, Director Hoffman, please continue. Um, before we go into the equity primer, one thought, I think the it's very respectful of the Planning Commission. Their, their duties are defined by municipal code. They're very limited uh, and we don't have individual design review here. Conditional use permits, variances and so forth are the hearing examiner. Uh, legislative things are typically city council or taking recommendations. This really is their duty and they they really bought in and did, did great work, extensive work. But please review and change it <laughs> where you see fit. This is uh, your action, city council action. So uh, given the time, I won't I won't dive into this too much. Um, the exhibit kind of explains the the parable of the story. you've you've seen it before. This is just one example. Um, but the important part is whether it's the the current Growth Management Act as amended, Vision 2050, or the or the King County countywide planning policies. Um, the the recent iterations went through this process and and really factored in equality and equity in every conversation. How it ends up is the local decision, um, but the lens to look through is informed by. Uh, this exhibit or cartoon, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, Christina, it, we're working through the contract issue. She's not available tonight. She will be available for whatever schedule um, that we present, uh, and she brings this up in a good way as part of each discussion, so I like leaving that portion to her, if I, can, if I may, and that's it. Thank you. Colleagues, any other questions for Director Hoffman? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Really appreciate this. this is a momentous occasion to receive this. Um, let's see, where are we right now? Well, goodness, we're at the consent calendar. I'd entertain a motion. Were yeah. we going to do the equity piece? Uh, I'm sorry to bring you back. <laughs> no I, I summarized it, but I, I want to make it available. And since tonight the goal is transmittal, um, uh, you sh if, if you haven't seen the Planning Commission uh, uh, videos or materials, this comes up whenever a large scale discussion in housing or transportation comes up. And the context is as policy is examined and or suggested to be amends, please look at it through this lens and see if these nine questions pertain to it. It doesn't uh, direct how that decision or policy sh policies should be crafted but it's intended to inform the effort and discussion. Having this discussion is really what a lot of the recent uh, legislation is about, but we still retain local control. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. consent calendar. What's your pleasure, council? I'd like to move the consent calendar. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt the consent calendar. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Guys have it. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Co colleagues, uh, ordinances and resolutions for introduction and referral. Katie, welcome. Uh, we're on resolution 24, 1969, authorized the mayor to sign a professional services agreement with Consort North America Incorporated for phase two, 30% design of the Beach Drive lift station project. It's a mouthful. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. I do have a presentation for for this. Yeah. Miss Phillips, I think we lost our friend from Consor who was online. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so someone well, from Consor was here. I didn't even know that. I think there was, yeah, I think there was somebody here besides uh, Michael. So I think somebody. Oh, earlier, yeah. yeah. Well, I will update them tomorrow. Um, but uh, thank you for everyone that is here. Uh, this, uh, what I'm presenting first to you tonight is the Beach Drive lift station contract. Uh, it's a professional services agreement with Consor to do 30% design for this project. We have talked about this project 
a number of times um, in executive session. And just to review, um, we do we do have uh, a system that's at the end of its life that we're looking to upgrade. Let me see. So the way it is right now um, on Beach Drive there, uh, the red line is the sewer main, and that runs through the private properties of five homes and the future uh, park and the current park. And then it comes down through the Civic Club and rejoins the right of way where it says lift station 16. The other lift station at the, at the top of the picture, lift station 17. Um, so there's two lift stations there serving just this small group of properties, which is more, more than you would usually have for a small swath of property here. And uh, the other issue is that the, the main is running through private property and it's, it's close to the lake. Um, so ecologically, it's, it's not great and it's, it's coming to the end of its life. So our plan is to rework this whole system with just one lift station and move the sewer main into public right of way so that we have access to it um, and can maintain it. Um, and what that would also mean is relocating the side sewers for the five homes and the parks so that they connect. Let me go to the next slide. So here is, is what that would look like. The red line here is the sewer main going down the street and the purple lines are the new side sewers connecting to it. Um, this plan uh, was created by Consor in their options analysis that they did for us earlier this year. Uh, they were excellent to work with and did great work and produced this very quickly. Um, they produced a number of options for us to look at. They listened very carefully to the city's uh, requests and needs. Um, and we were able to select the option that was best. And that's the one that's shown here. On the next slide, here's a, a detail closer up. Um, with all the trees, it's a little bit hard to see, but the future park is located there. It's marked and then Lion Creek Park is adjacent to it. And then you can see um, Beach Drive there. So we want to put the one lift station uh, as far from the park as we can um, while functioning for these properties. And um, so it's it's pointed out there. And then there's also gonna be a backup generator, which uh, will be for the lift station, but will also be used for the park. Um, so another layer to this whole project is that we're wanting to complete all of this before the park goes in. And, um, so we don't have to tear up the park after we put it in <laughs> to put this stuff in. Um, so this is the conceptual plan that Consor created. And um, from that, we wanted to move forward and do a 30% design. Uh, they um, provided us with a 30% design. We did go to, um, we did do um, a consultant roster RFQ and um, they did provide us with an SOQ. They were the only um, firm that did so. Um, their SOQ was excellent and their 30% design, in our opinion, was excellent. And um, with, with the contract that I'm presenting to you tonight, um, their design services would include project management design up to 30%, structural engineering, electrical engineering, permitting, critical areas, geotechnical services, and cultural resources services. So. There would be a lot of consultants working under this one contract. They're all listed here. Um, and the costs. So the options analysis, uh, just to look at the whole big picture, cost about $29,000. The 30% design contract uh, that I'm bringing to you tonight costs $225,000. And um, the the plan, the overall big plan construction, what we want to actually put in um, at the end of the road um, is estimated to cost about 2.574 million. And that's a very high level 
um, estimate. It's the AACE class five opinion of probable cost. So when you're looking at a, a high level cost like that, you really do have to consider the entire range plus 100% minus 50%, um, which is about one to 5 million. So it's a very big range at this point, but that's just because we're so young in this process that, that there's a lot of unknowns. Um, but those are all the costs uh, for this. Um, and the project is fully supported by the sewer capital fund. Um, and I think that's the last slide. Went through a lot of information. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Ms. Phillips. Colleagues, questions for her about the project or contract? Yes, Mr. Lebo. Um, so when you say it's fully funded within our surface water budget? Uh, sewer. Sewer. Um, thank you. Sewer. Um, are you thinking in terms of the 2.6 million or are you thinking in terms of the 5.1 million? 2.6. And okay, and so this thirty percent um, design, this um, two point two hundred and twenty five thousand dollars, is within what you had had anticipated. Yes, Minister. Hey, do you have the um, CIP number that we had talked about previously? What we yeah, the CIP forecast um, for design up to this point for 2023-2024 is 360000 Councilman Riddle. <clears throat> what kind of estimate would, would we have after the 30% design? How, how, how does that range narrow? What are we looking at? Um, it, it does narrow quickly. I don't think I brought the AACE uh, booklet up up here with me, um, but after thirty percent design, it does it does narrow to, to smaller range. Yes, yes. Okay, and then um, you sort of touched on it. What would happen if we didn't do this project right now? There would be the impact to the existing park and our new park. Um, what is the risk if we? delay this if something were to happen what would what is our risk on that um well because the the system is at the end of its serviceable life uh we we don't expect it to last a lot longer it it does still function today but if it were to fail in any manner it, it would be an emergency repair which would be more expensive and it would also be on private property and it would also mean tearing up private property or tearing up our park. Okay, thank you for that context. Yeah, there there may also, I haven't really looked into this, but there may also be ecological issues that we'd face if the main so close to the lake failed. Yes. That, that we, I, I don't even know if we'd be able to prevent something at that point. Okay, thank you, thank you. Councilmember for Tony. Thank you. And thanks, uh, Ms. Phillips, for your presentation. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, given that this is our first touch, um, is there some, uh, what is the word, uh, immediacy to uh, approving it tonight? Um, I, I wouldn't say that there is immediacy, uh, other than the fact that we do want to get this going before um, before the park, but I, th I think the park is just starting demo. So we are, we're not by any means behind schedule. And um, Consor and Herrera and everybody are waiting in the wings. Um, so, th but there's no immediacy, I, I should say. So yeah, the, the only reason I ask is because the staff recommendation is to move to adopt. It didn't say when, but you know, when you, usually when it's written there, it seems that you want it now. Right? Oh, so, oh. so so I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah. My apologies. I wrote that uh for all my presentations oh. tonight. So we <laughs> 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 like the optimism. Councilor yeah. Goldman. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, I was wondering, could you clarify, will the new lift station serve the Lakefront Park if there's bathrooms, for instance? And if so, is it design is it being designed to account for a future increase in capacity? Yes. Is that yes to both? Yes, it will serve. Yes, it's designed to accommodate that many properties at increased capacity. Okay, thank you. Councilmember. 
Mr. Zivo. I, I would just offer that um, I would not be surprised by significant cost growth in this. Um, to think that we're going to be able to put in the side sewers for the estimated price, recognizing that these homes will have significant um, hardscape and landscape features that they'll want to be uh, compensated for due to the loss. Um, I would not at all be surprised by 50% cost growth on this. Um, re repaving the street, for example, is only a consideration that they're actually only going to redo the trench. You're going to find that that's not going to cover it. $15,000 isn't going to pay much. So I would not at all be surprised by significant cost growth on this. Um, the other is that I would propose to the council that we um, waive the three-touch rule and, and move forward. I think I, I don't know that further discussion is going to um, get us closer. Get us closer. I mean, you need to do the engineering work to, to get closer on this. So, uh, Councilmember Lebo is recommending that we that you waive three touch rule. Is there a so, second for that? So I'll move that we uh, waive the three touch rule. Second. Okay. Is there any discussion on waiving the three touch rule? Councilmember Fertoni. And just to, uh, I want to express my appreciation for Councilmember Lebo. I am not an expert on any kind of these construction projects, so you know the the del the delay is of course built in so that we can ask questions about the contract and things like that. But if you have no further questions, I think this this is a perfectly okay thing to uh, waive the three touch roll for. Thank you, Councilmember. Any other comments on the point? Councilmember Golden. Um, yeah, I think I'll respectfully be opposing waiving the three touch rule. I think it's also for the public. And this is as you know, the contract is several hundred thousand dollars. And I think the community deserves an opportunity to weigh in if they have thoughts on this. And as um, project manager Philip said that there is she, uh, she doesn't think there's an urgent rush on this. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Riddle. Uh, a question for um, project manager. Oops. Um, this 30% design, uh, cost was, is in our current budget. So yes. it's basically been already approved and allocated in our current budget. Yes. Yes. The, the 360,000 is the number that's in our current budget. And this is less than that. Yes. Here we go. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Alexander, uh, any other questions or comments on waiving the three touch rule in this case? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. 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 Are there any nays? Nay. Okay, let the record reflect that it's six yeas to one nay. Thank you, Council. Uh, did you want to move on to? Yes, thank you. I will, um, I'll move that we adopt resolution 24-1969 authorizing the mayor to sign a professional services agreement with Consor North America Inc. for phase two 30% design for the Beach Drive lift station project. Second. It's been moved and seconded to uh, to adopt resolution 24 1969 authorizing the mayor to sign a professional services agreement sponsor America incorporated for phase two 30% design of each drive list station project. Are there any further comments? Councilor Riddle. Um, I'm pretty sure I've been hearing about this lift station uh, re replacement need for most of my tenure. <laughs> um, and it's one of those kind of like the, the tennis court lights, you know, it just <laughs> takes us a little while to get there. Um, and I'm really glad that we are getting there, hopefully, before we see uh, any unintended, you know, issues between now and, and completion of construction. So I'm glad that we're finally moving forward on this project. Thank you, Councilor. Any other comments? Yes, Councilor Golden. Yes. So while I voted against waiving the three touch rule, I'll vote in favor of the project itself because, <laughs> as you said, we need to replace the lift station, and so I have no objection to moving to thirty percent design. Thank you, Councilmember. Uh, any other questions or comments? All uh, hearing none. All those in favor of adoption of resolution twenty four nineteen sixty nine, please say aye. 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 Are there any? Are there any nays? Thank you, Lori. You guys have it. Thank you very much, Council. Thank you, Ms. Phillips, on this. And you are staying there, apparently, one more, right? Uh, resolution uh, 24, 1970. Is that correct? Uh, authorizing the mayor to sign contract with RW Lockwood Construction for construction of the 35th Avenue Drainage Improvement Project. Please. Thank you again. Have another presentation which is coming up, but um, 
I'll start by saying this, this is another project that you've heard about uh, in executive session a number of times. So it's not the first time we've talked about it. And um, this is an area that's, um, as far as I know, uh, been in need of improvement since as early as 2021 when there was a large landslide. And um, uh, it's it's been a process getting us to where we are now, um, but uh, a plan to improve this drainage in this area has, has been made. And I'm still waiting for the presentation. That's okay. Well, okay. There we go. So this is just an overview of the area. Um, so uh, drainage at this location it, um, needs to be improved. And um, originally there was a plan to reroute the drainage into right of way. And that um, was estimated to cost uh, more money than, than we wanted to move forward on. So a new plan was developed where um, we would keep the drainage system where it is on private property. Um, it's just in between those two houses there that were in that previous picture and improve upon it. Um, everything brand new, upgraded, updated. And Grant Osborne's completed this design and the, these are their plans. And we bid this project through the Small Works roster. We actually bid it two times. Um, didn't get any bids the first time. The second time we got one bid from Lockwood Construction and they submitted their bid uh, for 275,000 approximately. And let's see, uh, the engineer's cost uh, estimate for this project uh, initially was 288,000. That was at 60% design when it did include um, deck restoration, which is no longer a part of the scope. Um, so the updated engineer's estimate at 100% is 217,000, um, which we thought might be low. We weren't sure. It, maybe it is since this bid that we got is for 275. Um, however, um, the CIP construction forecast was just over a million. So we're well within that. Um, another thing that we have at this point is a construction management scope and fee estimate. Um, Gray and Osborne's going to do construction management for us. That's for 23,000. So reasonably priced. Um, and here's the cost of everything. So um, Gray and Osborne's design is that first number there, 135,000. And then construction, 275. Construction management, 23,000. And then we've also had to pay um, for easements and a settlement with the property owner that has a deck, which is one of the items that we've spoken about. Um, so all of that adds up to about 550,000, um, which again, it's it's less than we had in the CIP for just the construction. Um, so it, it seems reasonable and it's a lot cheaper than what I heard was the original plan for this project. Um, our proposed schedule for this work, uh, it, this, this is one that I'll say, I, I wasn't pushing to have you waive the three touch rule at the last one or for this one, I, I didn't mean to put that line at the end of it saying, I, I want you to do this tonight. I'm, I'm not trying to get you to do this tonight, but for this one, I will say that weather is a factor and this is construction um, on a steep slope in a narrow area. So they, it's gonna be hand tools only. And um, if it's raining and pouring, it, it will be a lot harder than if it's not. So that is one thing that we've been thinking of and why when we bid it, we didn't get any bids. We immediately bid it again because we're trying to get, move this before before the weather really turns. Um, so we do already have a few things in place. And if this um, was awarded tonight or next week uh, or two weeks from now, we would meet with our contractor on October 14th for a pre-construction meeting um, and also GNO. And then uh, we do also have the deck removal scheduled at this point ahead of October 14th. Um, and just as a reminder, what we set up with the deck owners is, um, we have a settlement with them, they remove their deck and then they replace it. And that's at their expense. Um, so their deck would go back up once this project is completed. And, and we're giving the contractor 25 working days to complete the project. We don't think it will take that long, a week or two. Um, so hopefully October or early November, 
everything will be buttoned up and um, can close the year out with this project being done before the weather really changes. So let me see. That's it for my presentation for this one. Thank you, Ms. Phillips. Questions, colleagues? Mr. Lebo. I would just offer that, um, you know, we don't buy cars and homes every day, but um, when we do, we're always struck by the uh, cost of everything. <laughs> and um, having worked in this kind of business for over three decades, um, I can't say that I'm never surprised by pricing, but um, things do cost a lot. And I would um, suggest that uh, given the work that has been done and the sense of, um, how do I say, oh, um, desire to move this forward, I would I would recommend that we waive the three-touch rule and take advantage of the opportunity here that's already been put in place with the homeowner and our contractor to move this work. Uh, the worst thing that could happen is that we don't get this work done in time and there is a, a significant landslide as a result of not improving our infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Leva. Colleagues, any other questions or comments? I, actually, there's a motion on the floor. I'm assuming that's a motion, Mr. Lebo. Or... I, I, I will move to waive the three-touch rule. I'll second that. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to waive the three-touch rule regarding resolution uh, 24, 1970. Would you like to speak to it? Yes. And I, I'm suggesting waiving the three-touch rule partly because we've talked about this project a lot. And I appreciate the fact that the staff has taken great pains to try to minimize the costs. I think that's an excellent uh, move. And um, judging from the contour lines on your map, that's where water wants to go anyway. So this might, you know, if we don't do it now, we might not do it till next summer. So yet, as uh, Councilmember Member Lee will point out, there's a significant landslide hazard here. So let's get moving on this thing. Thank you, Council Member. Colleagues, Council Member Goldman. Um, yes, I will again respectfully be a no vote on the three touch rule. I support the project, but as our project manager pointed out, we could consider this at our October 10th meeting and approve it then, give the public a chance to digest the 200 plus thousand dollar contract, and then approve it on the 10th and then still have that pre construction meeting on the 14th. So, in my mind, I don't see the rush and it would give the public a chance to view this. Thank you, Council Member. Deputy Mayor Bodie. Thank you. I'll be supporting waiving the three touch rule because uh, this is a project that we have discussed in open council session on a number of occasions, and uh, there never has been any community concern or opposition. In fact, it's a community benefit. Uh, so I'll be supporting the waiving of the three touch rule. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Bodie. Colleagues, any other? Comments regarding the three touch rule. Hearing no, none. All those in favor of waiving the three touch rule say aye. 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 Are there any nays? Nay. Uh, the record should reflect that there are six ayes and one nay in regards to waiving the three touch rule regarding resolution 24 1970. I would entertain a motion for adoption mm -hmm. of resolution 24 1970. Councilmember Belibo. I move that we adopt resolution 24-1970, authorizing the mayor to sign a contract with RW Lockwood Construction for construction of the 35th Avenue drainage improvements project. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt resolution 24-1970. Is there any further discussion, colleagues? Councilmember Goldman? Um, as before, I'll be voting yes. I support the project. And so if we're, if we're going to vote on it tonight, I'll vote yes. Thank you, sir. Any other comments on adoption of uh, Resolution 24, 1970? Hearing none, all those in favor of adoption of Resolution 24, 1970 signify by saying aye. 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 Are there any nays? The ayes have it. It passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Ms. Phillips. Excellent work, as always. Uh, I keep calling you director. I apologize, Phil. I'm just going to call you Phil. Phil, welcome. Hey. Thank you. <laughs> Administrator Hill. I'll still call you mayor, though. Yeah, you, <laughs> you can call me whatever you want. I'm, well, no. well, no. anyway, <laughs> behind uh, the scenes, you can call me whatever you want. <laughs> uh, resolution 24, 1971. Uh, this is to confirm the city's share of the 2526 Regional Crisis Response Agency budget. So you'll remember back in the fall of 2022, the city joined 
the other cities of uh, Kirkland, Bothell, Kenmore, and Shoreline to create the Re Regional Crisis Response Agency, which was the next iteration of the radar program started back in the day by Shoreline. Um, pursuant to the interlocal agreement, Section 12B, uh, the fiscal agent, which is Kirkland, has to provide uh, notice advising principal agencies of their share of the upcoming 25-26 budget and request that the council review that and then pass a resolution um, committing that they will include that in their 25-26 budget no later than December 1st, 2024. I'm bringing this to you now because Kirkland, in order to meet that with the holidays, would like to have it about mid-November um, and we've got time, so there's, there's no rush on that tonight. Um, at the formation of the agency, Kirkland had their own program that they were beginning to stand up. And so they had a lot of dollars invested into that. So they took on a disproportionate share of the cost in that first biennium, um, which lowered our portion to $183,804. Um, we at the time negotiated that we would do a pro rata share based on population in the next biennium. And those preliminary numbers at that time were $249,360. The proposed budget is $244,538 City of Lake Forest Park. There's a few nuances, and I don't know if you had the time to follow the link that I included in the, in the agenda cover. We have added a few positions, well, I think it's two positions within radar to better serve the public. One is um, the position right below Broken, I'm gonna forget the name, basically um, supervisor position, needing to add a supervisor position. The span of control for one supervisor with 13 navigators is just too great. And so we've added that position. Um, and I think, I think we added one more um, navigator. Uh, I'll, I'll get you the details. Sorry, I forgot to bring that with me tonight. Um, anyway, what we've done is we have a rate stabilization fund that the board has created during this um, last year. And that's come from the benefit of all of us putting in our dollars at the front end. And then it took a while to stand up. You remember that we didn't really go live until June 1st with the program of 2023. And then it took us a while to get everybody hired, it took us um, several months to get um, Brooke Bittner, our executive director hired. So we had some savings. We had a lot of discussion of what to do with the money. Do we rebate it to the cities or do we put it into a stabilization fund to kind of spread out the impacts of inflation that we knew were coming? So we had roughly $800,000 in there. Um, the, I, what came out of the meetings with the board is we determined that we'd allocate $200,000 of that a year for this biennium, anticipating that we would do the same thing in the next biennium, basically to keep the rate as flat as possible um, for the agencies. Um, also, we have um, created a 5% uh, operating reserve, 2.5% contingency reserve, equipment reserve, along with the rate stabilization, um, the operating contingency reserve of 246,000 and the equipment replacement reserve of 152,000 are fu fully funded and there's no projected um, use of those at this time. Um, the way that the city funded this is through the American Rescue Plan Act, ARPA lost revenue. We have paid for that, The uh, um, we set a lot of those funds aside, they're in unallocated reserves currently. And the recommendation for the 25-26 budget, and this, this dollar amount is included in your budget, is to pay for it with those um, reserve funds that came from ARPA. Any questions for me tonight? I'm not asking you to take action on this. I will bring this back at the uh, next meeting. I think I also have it scheduled for budget and finance to answer any um, detailed finance questions you might have on it, but stand for questions. Thank you, Administrator Hill. Colleagues, questions for Mr. Hill? Uh, thank you. Just from my understanding, so as I understand, the um, the nuance that you talk about doesn't change the allocation that's being proposed at approximately 244. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Yeah, I think we're um, we're paying five thousand dollars less than we anticipated when we entered into the ILA. Yeah, I'm good. Colleagues, any other questions for Commissioner? Yes, Councilmember Goldman. Yeah, um, thanks. Has there been any talk about changing the funding? So instead of just pure per capita, to have the funding based on the percentage of total calls usage. 
there's been some discussion there are there's one or two cities that have kind of raised that issue um, their councils have looked at it and seen that their proportionate share is a little higher than their usage um, percent or two off but there's been no formal request to move that forward but that that has been a discussion point from the beginning but today it's it's just pro rata based on population the riddle and, and I don't know if that's a good way of coming about it as we want people to use the service as opposed to worrying about if it's going to cost the city more money to use the service. I think a system that allows people to want to have their police officers bring in racer and, and have folks taken to the crisis stabilization center or wherever they need to go. I think we want to encourage the use of that um, rather than turn it into an accounting issue. Thank you, council member. Colleagues, other questions or comments? Thank you very much. Thanks. See you in Mr. a couple weeks. Appreciate it. Uh, we have nothing for council discussion or action. No other business. Council okay. committee. Yes. Um, did the deputy mayor have a sufficient opportunity to talk about the timeline of the comp plan? Fair question. Lori, would you like to add that to other business here? Yes. Uh, so I just wanted to recap that um, we have a lot of work to do if we, for example, want to have a public hearing December 12th or December 19th on our recommendations for our recommended adopted uh, comprehensive plan then that means we have quite a bit of work to do. There aren't very many meetings because of the holidays um, in, um, at, in the, at the end of November into early December. And we have quite a few special meetings scheduled to discuss budget. I don't know how much time budget is going to take up, but what I'm proposing is that I um, sit down with our community development director and map out um, a plan for with topics from the comprehensive plan for our discussions. We can, of course, expedite them if we don't have uh, much of a policy perspective or um, questions about how to uh, change them or edit the, those policies. Uh, because we're, we, what we are trying to do, and this is important work, set uh, the policies um, for the city for 10 years. That, so this is, this is important work, and uh, hence my concern about the timetable. So, uh, so I will be doing that and coming back to you um, with a, kind of a mock-up for, for discussion. And in the meantime, I do encourage you, the, the append, even the appendices, which I don't think we should take time to review, are really interesting about the history, demographics, economics of Lake Forest Park, history of equity and inclusion or not inclusion, exclusion in Lake Forest Park. Really interesting, but my proposal is that we uh, take a look at just the comprehensive plan policies and goals themselves and try to get those done by, uh, so that we have a working document by say December 19th. I am concerned that that's not good timing for asking the public for input. So if we could hit December 12th, that would be better timing, but I'm, um, I'm, I think it depends how quickly it goes uh, in our discussion. So I'm optimistic, but I'm gonna plan for kind of a moderate amount of conversation among ourselves uh, on how to proceed. So does that sound good that I will come back with a schedule after working with Director Hoffman? Colleagues? Okay, got head nuts all the way around. Councilor Goldman. Um, is it worth asking if any of us have mid-December plans? For instance, I'll be giving a final exam on December 12th, so I won't be able to attend. May, may I recommend that we send any times to uh, Deputy Mayor Bodie, and then she can take all of our blackout dates and, and understand it, uh, and that lets her kind of work her magic. <laughs> <laughs> 
That yeah. would be great. And not only that, we may try to take if if we complete budget um, sooner, uh, we could take advantage of some of the of the November seventh special uh, meeting that's scheduled, or we could schedule our own special meeting if needed to wrap things up if we feel like you know we're we're eighty percent through and we need a little more time. So I'll try to take a look at that. Also, your um, times you might be away, uh, any of those times, October, November, December, let me know. Uh, Mr. Hill and then uh, Vice Chair for a time. Attorney Pratt and I want to just point out to ensure as you put that schedule together that you're not voting the night that you have the public hearing. You need to be able to take into consideration what you heard at the public hearing and come back and take action at a later date. Thank so you. that argues for the public hearing being on the 12th, uh, notwithstanding Council Member Goldman's exam and uh, the final action being on December 19th. I'm just brainstorming. To, so I'm I'm trying to give us as much time as possible. I, I would offer that the 19th is a community. Um, there's a, a holiday party, Christmas ships that night. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, at the Civic Club. Um, Mr. Furtani, apologies. Yeah, and uh, thanks. And before we get bogged down in these details, I want to remind everybody on council that this is an amazing privilege. There are entire councils who don't get to review the comp plan, right? And so we have a once in a decade opportunity to set the rudder of the ship as it were of the city. And so, you know, look at it in that very positive light that we get to actually look at this document that will guide our actions for the next foreseeable future. Excellent comments. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Deputy, everybody, do you have what you need then from? I do um, a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> so send me your dates, please. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other items scheduling for other business, et cetera? Not moving on to council committee reports or any talking about committees, not individual council member reports yet. Any council committee reports? Um, council member reports. Who would like anybody? Bring something to the fore here to share. Mr. Furtani is looking thoughtful. Like, hey, yes. <laughs> oh, start off with one. No. Yeah. Please go right ahead. So, um, thanks. I attended the uh, um, the Sound Cities Alliance uh, phone call on joining boards on uh, what was it uh, Friday last Friday. And um, the deadline's coming up for that, and I don't remember where, when it is, but it's in October. So if any of you are interested in uh, um, uh, joining one of these regional boards that the SCA has control over, um, please, uh, uh, there's an application form. I'll send a link to basically the booklet that explains what each of these positions and boards do and you know what the uh, uh, commitment is. But the one thing I don't know is how, how does this council handle the appointments to those boards? I uh, I can't speak for the council, so okay. Deputy to... Rabodi, do you want to? Yes, I believe um, we come forward and as a council um, approve uh, a member as um, uh, as a member of that committee. But go ahead and apply, and and honestly, if you um, get a position, I'm sure we'll approve it. So it's a formality, pretty much at this stage. Councilman Goldman? Um, what I would add is we probably should coordinate as a council because what I've heard is that if two council members from the same city apply for the same committee, um, they won't try to figure out which one to choose and they'll basically throw both applications out. Thank you for that. Uh, Councilman Riddle. No. Mm -hmm. That's what I was going to say. Great minds think alike. Excellent Mr. point. So uh, please uh let the mayor or me know if you plan to apply and if sure. there is a conflict we'll uh follow up happy to help I, I think i think leadership did review to make sure there were no conflicts so everyone sent their preferred um pos uh, positions uh to to council leadership thank you thank very you much serious. did you have anything else mr Tony? uh other council member reports Okay, uh, mayor's report, just a couple of really quick things. Um, 
traffic cameras. Uh, since we started issuing citations, the speed has actually dropped to 23.6 miles an hour over that period of time in the couple of weeks that's happened. Um, it is noticeable. Um, regretfully, on the outside of that zone, we still see errant behavior, so we'll have to address that at um, some point. I did want to note uh, that Sound Cities Association Director Hoffman is stepping down in uh, uh, this fall. Um, and uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor Bodie, for sending that to me. I just actually had a meeting with him last week. Um, so they'll be looking for a replacement. And um, for those of you who know who's the previous director, Deanna Dawson, who's now head of the Association of Washington Cities, um, she set the bar incredibly high in that in that with that group. She's she's extraordinary. Um, let's see, the only other thing I had is my my weekly or semi-weekly wildlife report. The coyotes are back. So uh keep your cats inside. <laughs> uh yeah, they're they've been cruising around and um there actually have been a couple of cats that have been taken away. So for what it's worth. And Mr. Hill, anything to highlight from the administrator's report? Nothing in the administrator's report to highlight. You can read that. Um just a, a quick update on the Rose property. The Thank money you. is in escrow. The documents have been signed by the mayor and it will close tomorrow. So you'll be the owners of New Park. Bravo. Thank you for that. I must be really tired if we didn't talk about it. Uh, Mr. Fertoni. Want to add one other thing from the uh, administrator's report. The Bobcat sighting. Amazing. Okay. Yeah. I got one. <laughs> yeah. Initially, it was reported to be a cougar. I'm glad it was not a cougar. Thank you very much. Oh, My wow. backyard. Oh, yeah. Okay, uh, anything else for the good of the order? Okay, nothing else, uh, we are adjourned. Oh, no. Oh, exactly. Not session. Adjourned. Don't tease me with leaving. Okay. Unadjourned. Fine, we will, we will, <laughs> we'll adjourn to executive session. We'll be back, uh, we are not taking any action. Are you um, read the uh, I will read the thing. It is executive session, consideration of the acquisition of real estate Purchase or lease pursuant to RCW 42.30.110 friends, one friends B. Thank you, everybody. Pardon me? Thank you. How much time? Yeah. 10. Okay. Uh, let's give it five and, and if we need to extend, we'll extend. Is that fair enough? Okay. Uh, and are we staying here? Are we going? To yeah. the jury room? Stay here. Stay here. Okay. Thank you, everybody. We gotta wait. Close the door. Thank you. No. So excited that we we're yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Into, I, to I, there. Okay. Okay. I just I've got a um, litigate. Yeah. Yep.
Okay, we're back in regular session, everyone. And with that, we are adjourned.